When describing the essence of a video game, atmosphere is a word that is thrown around to the point of redundancy. If you ask someone what stood out to them in a game, they might say something like, I really love the soundtrack, it's so atmospheric. Or, the visuals were gorgeous, they really built the atmosphere. These responses pinpoint very distinctive fundamentals in a game that all hold merit in different ways, but they don't paint the whole picture. Atmosphere is a range of components, shaping a tailored mood or eliciting specific emotions. These are elements that, most of the time, you feel as a result of the moving parts working together. In essence, atmosphere serves as the force that unifies these elements and transforms them into an experience, rather than just a collection of impressive set pieces. Atmosphere exists as a lasting impact of a game's personality on your memory. The things that really pulled your attention at the start as well as the ones that kept you coming back. So let's return some meaning to this word. What exactly are the characteristics that define atmosphere, and ultimately, why is it important? There are a lot of different ideas that play into what creates it, but I think they can be best categorized under the umbrella of four different concepts. Music and sounds, gameplay, visuals, and flavor. These are the key aspects of successful game design, and they play a large role in establishing enticing atmosphere. So let's explore in depth what that looks like. Music and sound design may seem synonymous, but they actually have uniquely individual roles when it comes to really fleshing out a world. Music's role is to frame an identity for a specific area or moment with a composed set of ideas, and layer that in the background to establish a mood for the player. It makes a big difference when setting a tone, and it's often the player's first impression of something new that the game is trying to present to them. This is how a game elicits emotion right off the bat. Whether that be sending you into a totally relaxed state or pushing you to the edge of your seat, music is there to inform your senses and cue you in on the game's intent. One of my favorite tracks of all time is one that accompanies Skytown in Metroid Prime 3. This score is wonderful for a multitude of reasons, but I adore it because of how it enhances the atmosphere by pairing so well with the visuals. This section of the game encourages you to relax so that you'll slow down and read the bits of information scattered throughout the area, and this piece of music complements that perfectly. The sound of the choir is ethereal, and it emits this feeling that you're standing in what was once a thriving utopia. Now, it's an empty, yet beautiful landmark in the sky. It also comes juxtaposed to a rather intense moment earlier on in the narrative, so landing here and hearing this track is a masterful subversion of expectations that signals for you to let your guard down. Music was integral here to build out the experience of the game, and if it weren't for that track, though I would have enjoyed it, I doubt my sentiments about Skytown would have been as strong as they are. There's a reason why you can find so many people in the YouTube comments of game soundtracks sharing personal stories and experiences. Those moments were crafted by great music from games they loved. It's impactful, and the impression that music sets in our minds is indicative of how successful a tool it is for strengthening our intimacy with a game. Now, effective sound design takes a much more backseat approach. Its job is to surround the player in a rich auditory tapestry, blending familiar real-world sounds with novel ones so that the game is brought to life. Sound is the aspect of an atmosphere that's generally overlooked, and in a way, it's almost meant to be. If a game has good sound design, a lot of the time you may not notice it, but poor sound design is detrimental to the experience. Sounds flesh out the environment, from animal cries, footsteps, to weapon sounds. A game's immersive quality hinges on that distinctive Foley design. Even for sounds that don't already exist, they should feel organic when you hear them. If something doesn't sound just right, it's going to draw your attention away from the game and take you out of the experience. So sounds should be woven naturally into the game's DNA to enhance your immersion without breaking your focus. A great example of this takes place during skydiving segments from Tears of the Kingdom. When you fall towards the surface, a music track is set to play, and it's quite fitting.
When we listen to it outside of the context of the game, though... It feels like it's missing something, and that's because it is. On its own, this track is great, no doubt, but the empty spaces in the music are meant to be filled out by the sound of the wind rushing past you. In this instance, the sound design completes the experience, but is barely noticeable in practice. It adds so much to foster this feeling of total immersion, yet is seamlessly mixed in with everything else. That is sound design done right. Gameplay is a translation of a game's themes and narrative style into an entertaining activity. It's the reason why so many people will come back to play a game they've already beaten five times. Every experience is new, and every one's experience is different. This is what sets games apart from other forms of media, as it actually involves your personal input into the outcomes of the characters and story. Gameplay should be fun and intuitive while also being thematically appropriate, but this isn't to say that a game can't have mechanics that massively deviate from what you might expect out of a certain narrative genre. Suspension of disbelief only allows for so much though, if it's over the top, it's not really going to create a coherent world. If a game has unwieldy controls, or maybe just mechanics that don't match the tone, it can fail to really invest you in the context of the story. Imagine if in Celeste, the difficult platforming segments were swapped out and replaced with first-person Doom-style gameplay. It could work in a weird way, but the point is that the game would be less successful at conveying its themes. When you fail at platforming, you feel the frustration that Madeline likely is also feeling in-game. In that case, you've become more connected to the character through your shared experiences. When you overcome the challenge and make it to the top, you not only feel a sense of accomplishment of your own skill, but also satisfaction knowing that you've helped Madeline achieve her goal. The trial and error platforming builds on the idea of overcoming anxiety and frustration that the game drives home so hard. It would be distasteful if the gameplay didn't reflect that. While this is the case for most games, a lot of titles vary between vastly different gameplay structures and are still successful at establishing a rich atmosphere. RPGs are the prime example of this, where you're typically split between two types of playstyles, overworld roaming and battle simulator. These styles, despite their differences, often flow really well together for a game revolving around a combat-centric plot. Some games even go as far as to restrict your actions from what you might expect in real-life scenarios while still amplifying immersion. The horror genre is notoriously good at this. Take, for instance, Five Nights at Freddy's. Maybe you'd bring something to defend yourself with, or extra batteries for your flashlight. I mean, personally, I don't even think I'd go into work after the first night, but that's not the point. You're glued to that chair, helpless for a reason. You can only look around and check the cameras, so when you put on that empty Freddy mask or close the doors, you're forced to sit in horror wondering if you're going to get jump scared in the next couple seconds or not. The game throws so much at you to manage, while also allowing you to do virtually nothing to combat the things that are actually a threat. It's a masterful execution of limiting a player. Regardless of the style, gameplay is an integral factor in immersion because it's the actual connecting force between you and the narrative. It's what gets people hooked on a game, and it's the reason games are so entertaining and enchanting. If the mechanics aren't engaging, it's unlikely you'll even give the game a second thought. But if it appeals to the atmosphere in a unique way, it can make for some of the coolest experiences media has to offer. Video games are filled with some of the most rich and developed worlds in fiction, and most of that is because of their commitment to unique visual design. If music is how a game tastes and gameplay is its texture, then visuals are the presentation of the meal. This is the aspect of atmosphere where everything comes to life. Developers are able to mesmerize you by bringing the core elements of their vision to the game's forefront with visually stimulating ideas. I'm not just talking about graphical fidelity, because while that can be important, plenty of games utilize weaker technical engines and still build gorgeous worlds. 
What I mean is a various range of interesting and unique settings that are relevant and important to the tone that the game is trying to establish. For instance, Xenoblade Chronicles' decision to have the game take place on the bodies of two titans is not only an incredibly intriguing narrative piece, but it makes for some of the most creative world design in any video game to date. Generic environment tropes suddenly become more interesting because they're required to explain their origin through observational nuance and organic detail. This kind of visual design does so much work to build the atmosphere of the game that it results in a deeply immersive adventure. On top of the actual detail put into a given locale, art style is also an essential tool because it directly plays into determining the mood a player will embrace when engaging with that setting. The stylized look of Super Mario Galaxy exudes the fantastical carefree feeling of exploring and adventuring, while The Last of Us's more realistic grit contributes to its bleak and hopeless climate. Many video games have uniquely crafted aesthetics designed specifically for them in order to match their thematic aura, so an art style that complements that not only gauges player interests, but sets the tone for the entire experience. Building on this foundation, the artistic utilization of color and lighting further deepens this immersion. Next time you play a game, pay close attention to how the color palette changes in between areas or how the lighting shifts during the day and night cycle. Chances are the visual changes that take place affect the undertones in the atmosphere, directing you to feel differently solely through what you see. Weather elements like fog and rain are also commonly used to build the identity of an environment by adding a sense of ambience or realism. When utilized effectively, lighting is capable of reshaping your spatial perception by adding a new dimension to seemingly familiar areas. A rich atmosphere is made by its imagery, and games stand out as a form of media largely due to their aesthetic variety. They're a collection of some of the most intriguing, immersive, and detailed world building, and they are so effective at it because of their visual design. Finally, we come to the most important aspect of building an atmosphere, flavor. Even after successfully encompassing all the components I've already talked about, if there's no flavor, it's all in vain. But before we talk about it, what exactly does flavor mean? Primarily what I'm referring to here is the context that the story takes place in, though it's much more than that. Flavor are the elements that bring a story to life, so the actual narrative writing, as well as hidden lore, character attributes, voice acting, anything that adds depth to the experience. Flavor is at the heart of what makes every atmosphere, because it provides you context and reason for everything that you do in-game. What motivates the main cast? What are the reasons they succeed or fail? What's the backstory of this world they're exploring, and what makes it so special? These details are essential in immersion, but their purpose exists beyond validating the continuity of in-game events. They exist to compel you as the player to complete the game of your own volition. Flavor is about infusing meaning into the smallest, seemingly minute details, so that the game is brimming to life in every aspect. Random locals dropping facts about the lore or the specific architecture style of a dungeon you're in may be easy details to write off at first, but they train your subconscious to think a certain way while you're playing a game. Finally, putting all that information together and finding a new weapon that was alluded to or discovering a secret area on your own is such a joy and it keeps you invested, even during the slower paced portions of the narrative. What's more is how developers are able to weave all these intricacies together and still manage to make them relevant to the cast. Having characters that grow and learn just like real people is so resonant and relatable that it makes me excited to meet the new cast of every game I play. Watching a character you thought was super annoying at the start of a game evolve into the most developed and complex hero out of everyone is such a rewarding journey and it makes the game feel so much more real as a result. Games are pieces of art made to tell stories in ways that no other form of media can and it's through these little details that they're able to achieve that. If it's done right, it can create some of the most genuine experiences, not just in gaming, but in general. 
These kinds of ideas are what ties everything together. Because, sure, visuals can show and music can tell, but the rest is up to your own brain. And if you're not convinced, all those other elements don't matter. Flavor is the facet of atmosphere that transforms a game from a fun time on your couch into a tangible experience that you can be a part of. If there's one single reason why people can get so immersed in video games, it's because the flavor was perfect. Atmosphere is difficult to describe, and even harder to capture, so when it's successful, it catapults you into an ocean of unique concepts. It answers the question of why games are such an enigmatic form of media with a player base as big as it is. With so many thoughtful artistic qualities, it's no wonder people are able to get sucked into their favorite worlds for hours on end. Playing games has become totally immersive, and it's thanks to visionaries like Shigeru Miyamoto and Tetsuya Takahashi that saw something in the human experience that they wanted to share with everyone else. Games are so unique in the sense that you can explore entire worlds in the comfort of your own living room. Some people may not ever have the luxury of journeying outside the borders of their own country, but somehow, games are able to take you to unimaginable places and be just as enamoring in an entirely different way. It's through music, through visuals, through the intuitive gameplay that these real and emotionally raw interactive works of art are so impactful. Atmosphere is such a powerful tool, one that makes or breaks a game, and I hope it's a little more apparent what that means now. Atmosphere is the living soul of the medium, elusive but profound.